Fredericksburg Live. Go, go, go. See, see, see. Do, do. Thank you. What up, y'all? This is Anthony Campbell. <laughs> see? That's what I'm saying. What up, y'all? What up, y'all? <laughs> hey. Okay, All okay, right, here, okay. We go. here we go. Get serious, get serious. What's going on? <laughs> and you, and see, now here we go. Serious now, here we are. How y'all doing? This is Anthony Campbell, and uh, welcome to another edition of Fredericksburg Live. Today I have the distinct pleasure of being, having sitting right next to me, the first lady, our very own first lady of blues, Miss Gay Adegbalola. Uh, Gay, thank you so much for sitting in with us today. I've been looking forward to this opportunity to sit next to you and talk about everything that is that is you, um, all of your accomplishments. There's so much that we're going to learn today from you. Uh, how, how long is it, show? You know what? We're going. We're going. We might have to end up doing a part one and part two if need okay, be. That's what right, we'll do. Okay. But we want. We want the whole story of okay, you. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm just teasing. No, I, that that is very true. I um, a little bit about that. We've got a little bit of background on uh, on a lot of what we've done. We were going to script it and figure out from there how we're going to do it. But I think the best thing to do is for y'all to just sit in and let the tape roll, and we just kind of see where we where we go with that. Um, Gay, tell me a little bit about how you how you came to be the the, the entertainer that we know today. Um, you know, so much of, of the experience of who you are mm -hmm. is born out of, of, of a creative nature that was in that has always been inside you. Mm -hmm. um, that probably even transcends your music. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about how how it all started for you. Well, I guess you got to go back to the source, and that would be Mama and Daddy. Okay. Okay. Um, my dad was a musician. My dad was, without a doubt, the most creative person I've ever met. Uh, he was an artist. He was a writer. He could put together shows anytime anybody needed a fundraiser here in Fredericksburg. And we're talking black folks in the black school, um, band uniforms or the American Legion or whatever. He would put a show together and he, could, he had the talent of bringing all kinds of people together to okay. put on a show. Uh, my mother was an incredible organizer and she uh, from her, I learned how to get things done. If you're putting together a CD, you can't just go and put it together and put it out. You have to time yourself and plan okay. that thing. And, and my dad, um, while he used to put on all these programs for fundraisers back in the day, he took that same kind of talent and dedication and he started a young people's theater group. In the, He actually started in the late 60s and I came home in, uh, to help work on it in 70, 71. And Harambe lasted, um, oh, until 87. Harambe. So that was Harambe 360 Degrees Experimental Theater, Inc. Very and cool. uh, yeah, uh, it was so essential for um, young people, teens mainly, to have a creative outlet. Because this was right when schools were really starting to desegregate. Okay. Mind you now, I didn't say integrate. So black uh, athletes, the, the guys, they had a role to play and they had acceptance in the high school more. But girls in particular, they couldn't be cheerleaders. They weren't in the drama club. And those guys that weren't athletes, they needed an outlet too. Right. So right. Uh, it was through Harambe that we had... Um, original plays. We had a writing class. We had a, an adult um, acting group that did plays like Raisin in the Sun and Pearly okay. Victorious. We had a drumming group. Marines came down to, from Quantico and taught drumming. Uh, girls from Murray Washington College, black girls, came over to Harambe to help teach dance and, and singing. And uh, we had about, I guess at our, our peak, we had about 80 kids participating on a regular basis. And um, um, my dad did this. My dad passed in 77, okay. and I carried it on for a while. We had a great um, uh, board of directors. i tell you who was in Harave, who my dad helped to train was Xavier Richardson. Oh, my goodness. Uh, couldn't act at all. 
<laughs> but, <laughs> but, guess what? That one. <laughs> but guess what? We gave him all the money to handle. He was a kid in high school, wow. and he paid all the bills, and he, he took the money. We had a Miss Black Teenage Fredericksburg pageant. We had a Black Arts Festival, which is still going on. Right. We had a Kwanzaa um, uh, group, and, and it was an incredible experience. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, my mother was a really wonderful actress, hmm. and um, she used to do poems and used to be in plays, and I learned that from her. Uh, I also learned from her, she ran the, the youth canteen for the teens in Fredericksburg. And after she'd bring the old 78s home when they changed the jukebox, and I listened to, I played the, you know, the dominoes, the clovers, uh, all those people. That's cool. Ruth Way Brown, back, eh? until the grooves turned white, right? <laughs> and my dad, he had a jazz combo, and um, my house was full of music growing up. So um, as we were talking earlier, uh, people just see you on stage and they think it's all fun right. because they're being entertained. But it's just so much work and so much business. Um, it's called show business. That's and very true. and so you don't have a career in music unless you know somebody and got a lot of money and you got contacts. That's one route. But the top 40 is just that. The top 40 is 40 people. Right. And there are millions of people trying to do what I've been able to do and make a living doing. Yeah, kids, I hope you're paying attention to that. That's, <laughs> that's good knowledge for you right oh, yeah. there. You have, you have a lot that you have to do. Gay, let me ask you something. You, mm -hmm. you talked about this, you know, your, your, your parents being the catalyst for, for this from your creative side. Um, what, what time frame are we talking about? What era was this that, that you're talking about when, when your, your folks my, were doing My folks were doing this? All right, well, well, just first of all, I was born, raised, still live in Fredericksburg. So this was while I was um, all the way through elementary school and high school. Any time there was an event uh, at the school, my dad was the MC, And uh, it's amazing because what he did, he imitated all the preachers. Oh, he yeah. <laughs> could imitate each one. <laughs> their mannerisms, their their diction, whatever. He emceed all. He not emceed. He was the commentator for all the football games. Oh my goodness! Um, you know, he knew how to do that kind of thing. And like I said, my mother was just so creative. Uh, my mother spearheaded the campaign to get um, uh, Rem Davies elected to city council and then to mayor. And my mom would, would organize this thing so that block by block she had uh, people registered and block captains and transportation. My mom organized the sit-ins here in Fredericksburg. And um, it's quite a creative task to move people from Mayfield to downtown with no transportation, with no telephones. People didn't have phones. People right. didn't have right. cars. Right. And yet and still, we shut down three or four lunch counters in downtown Fredericksburg. So it was my mom's creativity and my mom's organizational skills um, that, that also spearheaded not just my, my in, entertaining mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. but also my sense of activism. Yes. You, you know what? I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because what that, what that tells our listeners is we're talking about... Um, a side or a time frame in Fredericksburg that wasn't very attractive in the eyes of uh, the, the way we would look back now. I mean, mm -hmm. for me, as a, as a younger person, um, I, so much of what happened during the, during the Civil Rights Movement mm -hmm. was historic. Mm -hmm. um, when we talked about the marches in Selma, when we talked about uh, you know, even the... Uh, Martin Luther King speaking on the mall in Washington, D.C., all of that is... I was there. You were there. 63. See, all of those things that we talk mm -hmm. about are, from a historic standpoint, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those very sobering realities when we, talk, when we think about the fact that that actually, you know, all of this w went on in Fredericksburg as well. Yes. You know, b black people um, during, that pe during that period were also dealing with the same problems that they mm -hmm. had in in the South, maybe not as front page, you know, from from the standpoint oh, yeah. of uh, they got the coverage. Well, 
Well, part of what happened all down through the South is that every town went after the same chain stores. So it wasn't just in Fredericksburg that we were picketing and sitting in at Woolworths. All over the South, Woolworth was being hit. So we were just one link in a chain. You know, it, it, it took everybody working in the same direction. Sure. So it was uh, Newberry's Grants, People's Drugstore, now CVS. Um, but uh, what I was going to say is that while we were struggling for these rights, while we were struggling to sit with whites, to eat with whites, to go to school with whites, and we thought that was the be-all, end-all, now in my old age, I look back and I realize what a phenomenal growing up experience I had. Um, first and form foremost, the teachers that I had at Walker Grant, they're the best teachers I've ever had. Oh, and I've gone to several schools, okay. several colleges. Okay. And uh, my teachers there were, were great teachers because everybody put such an importance on education. Sure. Right. And at the same time, you know, uh, I'm looking at this poster of a, of a dance that's going on at a sugar shack. And I knew that, too. Right. You know, we had the dances. And uh, dance was my life. People say... People nowadays, they'll go to a blues concert and there's Etta James on the stage. I grew up dancing to Etta James. I went to a dance in Richmond, uh, and Ray Charles was the band that was playing. Oh, my goodness. You see, and what I say had just come out and everybody was doing the everybody. bird band. All right, so see the woman in the red dress. See the red woman with the red dress on, she can bird land all night long. I knew that. And that was my... Um, those were my formative years. I had such good things in my formative years. And so now, and you know, we played in the streets. We played tag, we played hide and go seek, we played uh, red light, you know. We, we, we shot marbles, and it was a joyous thing. So when I look at people with Wii machines or whatever, right. yeah, and when I look at people playing on computers, um, and I'm talking young people. Sure. It's like, well, I had a good time. Right. But at the time, I thought there was something better. Right. You know, I thought there was something better. I left Fredericksburg in 1961, and I went to school in Boston. I went to Boston University. I um, majored in biology and chemistry, minored in chemistry, and I thought I was coming back home to be a doctor and to help my people. Well... I like to party a little too much. <laughs> it happens to <laughs> yeah, the right. of us, yeah, right? so I don't big, I don't <laughs> begrudge a doctor any medicine because uh, any money. You know, when you go and pay the doctor and you say, oh, my God, he charged whatever. That doctor gave up his youth right. or her youth to be a doctor. To pursue that career. Yeah, and I didn't give up my youth. I mean, you sit there for hours and memorize stuff. You just, you know, you're right. there every weekend, every day. So uh, I went up to school in Boston. Um, thinking that I was going to freedom up north. Um, and that's what we were led to believe, that life was, was different. Uh, Shangri-La was, uh, was up different. north. It was different. Everybody up there was holding hands. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so the racism was, was quite the same. It was just, you know, uh, covert instead of overt. Right. Yeah, it was, right. it was there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, I moved from, away from the philosophy of Dr. King which was to love everybody and hold hands and, and to, to fight for equality. Now, hold and on. I went into a whole uh, black power kind of philosophy. Now, t let me ask you a question. I, I have heard that that, that happened. Um, you tell me your experience, but a, a, a lot of young blacks during that period of time felt like Martin Luther King's method of, of passive resistance mm -hmm. and... Uh, the nonviolent side just wasn't moving the bar fast enough. Was that what you felt was the, the, the catalyst behind you becoming more of a, uh, of, of a uh, more militant, I guess, if you use that word? I think, the, I think the catalyst became, you know, you saw so many black folks who were peacefully protesting mm. get beat up, mm. get fire hosed, mm -hmm. have dogs so many black folks today are scared of dogs not pit bulls but german shepherds a lot of a lot of people especially my age are really scared of dogs because dogs were 
sick though in you, you know, sick them, go get them, eat them. And so it came to a point like, why am I going to let somebody be violent with me and I'm trying to be like them? How can I want to be like these people who hate me? Hmm. So it was a different thing. So at that point, I stopped straightening my hair. You see, it was a thing back in the day where, where blacks felt that your hair was good hair, you know, and something was wrong with nappy hair. Mm. You know, that was the opposite side. Straight hair was good hair. Uh, by the same time, token, up until I took an African name to kind of demystify. So many people are afraid to say my name and all they have to do is look at it. All you have to do is look at it and read it. But if it said Wojohowitz or, or something like that, right. they would read that. Right. So there was so much hatred that we were putting on ourselves. Um, you know, and, and things, just, just little things that you don't even think about. Sure. You think about uh, black male. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's white male. You know, right. yeah. uh, or devil's food cake is, is black or brown. And angel's food cake is white. Mm. So white is always representing fairness. And at the same time, these are the people who are hating you and beating you and bombing you and killing little girls in churches, right? Mm. So, yeah, I became more militant. And I adopted a philosophy of uh, Malcolm X. Okay. Yeah, I, that, was, that was my uh, philosophical guide at the time. And musically, it was Nina Simone. Okay. Yeah, and I'm okay. and I'm very proud okay. to say that I'm going to be playing in the Nina Simone Festival in her hometown in September. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And now where now let, where is that? Tryon, North Carolina. Tryon, North Carolina. Right. Tryon, so North Carolina. The, the, now now remember, Gay uh, Fredericksburg Live is based on on the, the the happenings that go on in our area. Okay. But because it is net based, you know, people can see this oh, all okay. over the world. Right. So. Right. That's very good to know. So for, for those of you who will be in Tryon, North Carolina. In, yeah, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a, that big, but it's down uh, past Asheville, okay. actually. So okay. it's way over in western uh, okay, North Okay, it's in Carolina. western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Well, well that's, that's excellent. Now, um, you, you mentioned the philosophical differences that led you in the direction mm -hmm. that, that, you, that you went. Um, but it also, the fabric somehow was knit together to connect you musically as well. So was it at this time that we were starting to not only develop a, a desire to, to tell your story or the story of your people mm -hmm. through music to also to, to, to share that, that social um, concern that you had for, for your people and, and for our advancement. I keep saying your people, they're, they're, okay. they're our, my people too. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be uh, independent, but I, you know, this is, this is very much a part of, of who who I am and, right, exactly. and how, how we became a part of this. Right. But I'm enjoying hearing it from an yeah. historic side. Yeah, at this particular time in my life, I was living in New York. Uh, after I finished school in Boston, I went to DC, lived for about 18 months. That's a whole nother thing. But uh, then I moved to New York. I felt I was ready for the big city now. Big, city, big time. Uh, big time. And it was in New York that um, my uh, musical, awareness was really broadened. I really got into gospel music because the gospel music that I knew here was, you know, trust and obey, because there's no other way. Or leaning on Jesus. Sure. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't, you know, get right church and let's go right. home. Man, I saw James Cleveland, I saw the Swan Silvertones, I saw uh, the Blind Boys of Alabama, Alabama, the Blind Boys of Mississippi. Jackson Yeah, I, I, I saw the Swan Silvertones. That was yeah. my favorite group. I saw the Staple Singers probably 20 or 30 times. Um, and so that was, that was one piece of my history that I had sure. been mission, missing. But I also got heavily into jazz. And I loved, lived across the street from a, a jazz club. And uh, so I got to see um, Pharaoh Saunders and I got to see Archie Shepp and James Handy. I fell in love with John Coltrane's music. Oh, yeah. He had died at the time, yeah. but I got to see his piano player and his drummer. And, um, and then I got to see some wonderful singers like Betty Carter. Um, so so, so I, I grew a lot. 
And then at that time, I married, and um, my my husband was working with and helping to manage a group called The Last Poets. Now, if you've read anything about um, uh, Gil Scott Heron dying this past week, he will say that he grew out of The Last Poets. As far as I know, The Last, Last Poets were the first rap group ever. They did poetry to drum beats. To drum beats. To drum beats. Okay. And, um, I mean, we used to have this in my living room. We would get on the subway and do it. And do it. And do it, yeah. Mm. Um, and they had a, a loft uh, on 125th Street called the East Wind where we would gather and um, do poetry and song and dance. And um, it was an exciting time. We saw ourselves as being revolutionaries. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And we embraced we embraced our our blackness as opposed to trying to be white. Right. Uh, we just loved ourselves mm -hmm. instead of not loving ourselves. Well, that would so. have been a revolutionary concept, mm -hmm. certainly in Fredericksburg at the time, because I know as a child it was uh, it, it may not have even been stated, but it was an understood even within families there were there were darker family members. Right that somehow weren't viewed as favorably right. as the lighter skinned right. family members. Exactly. Um, so I remember seeing that as a, as a child where even subconsciously maybe we were, we had become in some instances our, our own worst enemy. Right. We're back to uh, good hair. Right. You know, and if that's not a, a, a put down of who you are, I don't right. know what is. Right. You know. And we still hear a lot of that today. Oh, yeah. We still hear a lot of that sure. today. Now, um, what brought you back home? <laughs> Easy. <laughs> well, um, I came back home because I had a, I was raising my child by myself, and I knew that New York City was not a place mm -hmm. to raise my child. I, I knew that. So that brought me back home. Uh, some heartbreak brought me back home. And um, when I got back here, I was just in a fog for about a year. And uh, I got a job doing the census for the, for the public schools. Okay. And okay. Mr. Sneed was the school <laughs> superintendent. And that following year, they needed three uh, science teachers at the middle school and he knew I had a degree in science and um, he asked me to come teach and I did, I'd never had an education class but they gave me two years to get certified and I and I took to it I took to it science is like doing magic shows that's yeah. beautiful yeah I loved it watching the light come on for these little kids yeah yeah well they weren't exactly little kids I taught eighth grade eighth grade science and the exciting thing about eighth grade is that from one day to the next, they don't know if they're men and women or boys and girls. I hear you. That's the, that's the era of raging hormones. <laughs> yeah. Raging hormones. Yeah. And I think that any teacher who teaches seventh or eighth grade, they should be paid double. Mm. Yeah, they should yeah. be paid double. So um, now you, you taught in, in Fredericksburg City Schools. I taught How in long? Walker Grant. My... my um, my room, for the most part, was my homeroom when I went to school back in high school. Was not. Yes, it was. That's cool. Talk yeah. about going home. 